let's talk about kissing. You know, making out. When was the last time you kissed someone? Who kissed someone last night? Raise your hand. One, two, few, few, good. How about who kissed someone this morning? Great. I won't ask for details, but I'm happy for you. What does kissing communicate? What does kissing mean to us? We don't kiss just anyone on the streets, do we? You don't get around asking, hey, how are you? Mwah. <laughs> Unless you are French. Yeah. Yes, in some countries they do. We kiss people that are dear to us, that we have a relationship with, many times intimate relationship. We kiss our children, our parents, grandparents, grandchildren. We kiss our lovers. We kiss Holy Bible. We kiss the flag. And so, kissing always communicates a very special relationship with the person or the object we kiss. In Catholic Mass, kissing happens three times. Have you noticed? At the very beginning of the Mass, when the priests arrive and venerate the altar, they kiss the altar table. The second kiss happens right after the gospel is proclaimed. A deacon or a priest says the gospel of the Lord. She or he raises the book and places a kiss on the page from which the text was read. And lastly, there is a holy kiss again on the altar table right before the priests and the altar servers go back in recessional. So we kiss the objects that are special to us, that we consider holy or sacred. And if you think about it, your relationship with your lover with your child, with your parent, is holy and sacred. That's why you kiss them. You acknowledge and you revere the sacredness of that unique relationship you have with that person. So, in 19... 78, when a newly elected Pope, John Paul II, went on his first international trip to Mexico, people were surprised, some shocked, some scandalized, when he walked down the steps of his papal plane in his immaculate white cassock. He lifted the edges, knelt on the dirty ground of Mexico City, and he placed a kiss on the ground of the airport. People were scratching their heads what the heck is going on? Why is he getting his white vestments dirty? Why is he kissing the ground of Mexico City? 
Then a year later was another trip, this time to Poland. And guess what? He knelt and he kissed the ground. And there were countless other trips to France, to Germany, to South America, Central America, North America, West Europe, Asia, Africa. And every single time when he disembarked the plane, he knelt and he kissed the ground. Even as he was getting older and, and sicker and weaker, he had his people lift him up from the ground because he couldn't stand up on his own. And yet, he kept kissing the dirty ground of the airport wherever he landed. People were advising him, you know you're getting older, let's stop the theatrics. But if you have met any Polish man, we, you know we are stubborn. You know that we don't stop just because someone tells us to stop. So he would not. It happened once before in 1969 that another pope kissed the ground before John Paul II. Paul VI, when he traveled for the first time to Holy Land, he did the same gesture. But everybody was okay with that. No, this is the Pope coming for the first time in 1969 years to Holy Land. And even as the name suggests, the land is holy, so we will let him kiss the ground because it's a holy land. But kissing the ground in Mexico City? Why would it be holy? It's dirty. There are drug mobsters all over Mexico. There is nothing holy about that overpopulated city. How about Poland under communist rule? Or France or Netherlands? Countries that are governed by very lay-sized parties, many times anti-Catholic governments. He would kneel and kiss the ground stubbornly as Pauls can be stubborn. As people were trying to decipher that symbolic meaning of papal kiss, John Paul II was communicating to everybody who was watching that for him, Every ground is holy. Every place is sacred. Every nation, every people deserves to be honored and respected. You see, in the gospel passage today, two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, have an idea what the kingdom of God should be like. It should be glory, glory and fabulous place to live. So they say, Jesus, by the way, can we sit on your right and left hand in the kingdom of God? Jesus says, I'm not sure you know what you are asking about because that kingdom is not what you picture it to be. That glory is not what you think of glory. Can you drink the cup I am drinking? Can you receive the baptism with which I am about to be baptized? Jesus was talking about the cup of his passion, sacrifice, death. 
This was not the kingdom full of glory, gold, and fabulous vestments. This was a kingdom of sacrifice, of service to others. This was a kingdom of bloody and dirty way of the cross. And yet it was the kingdom of God. James and John had a very different perception of what the kingdom of God should be. Jesus showed them that what they think of the kingdom is one thing, and what we, he thinks and how he lives out the kingdom is another thing. So when John Paul II kept kneeling and kissing the ground, not only in the Holy Land, but all over the world, in Uganda and Kenya, in Germany, in Peru and Colombia, he communicated to us that each one of these lands is holy, that each one of these grounds is sacred, that even though people have that perception of what is holy, what is sacred, it doesn't always follow God's perception of holy and sacred. We too sometimes know exactly what it means to be holy, what it means to be in a holy and sacred relationship, what it means to live a holy life. But many times our understanding of holy and sacred is not necessarily God's understanding. When God looks at your life, when God looks at your journey, when God looks at your relationships, God recognizes the sacredness of your life of your relationship, of your experiences that for many people may not appear holy and or glorious. What for others can be scandalizing or dirty, for God is sacred and holy. And when John Paul II kissed every ground, he communicates this very message. Every journey, every life is holy and sacred. As a human being, John Paul II wasn't perfect. Again, if you know Paul's, you know we are not perfect. He has made plenty of mistakes, just as you and I have. But in that sacred gesture of kissing, every dirty ground of every busy airport, I believe he redeemed the papacy and he gave us a wonderful lesson of recognizing sacredness and holiness in every human life. Amen.